I want to do a uh, short teaching today as an introduction to the book of Ephesians. So if you can turn there, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I've been thinking lately how important this particular book, this particular letter is. It's a very special letter, the book of Ephesians. I joke a little bit that I say if you pronounce it instead of in Hebrew instead of Ephesians, but Ephesians, it means a bunch of people that are worth zero. So we can receive this for ourselves that we are the Ephesim and not the Ephesim. But uh, let's just look at the first verse. It says um, Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. It says this, and this is from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, unto the saints who are in Ephesus. Now, I don't know if in your version, but in mine you have a brackets around the word Ephesians. Now, I understand that to mean that this was not just a letter to Ephesus, but was a master letter that he sent to all of the churches, and they sort of plugged their name into, into each one. In other words, there was something that was uh, of this letter that is pertinent to all of the worldwide body of believers. And that's why it is such an important letter. It kind of stands out in its, in its sort of universal view of understanding what God's purposes are. I would also say it represents... To my mind, a, a certain peak point of Paul himself understanding God's purposes for the body of Christ worldwide, for the body of Messiah, for the church worldwide. And in just a minute, we're going to stop using the word church. We'll get to that in just uh, a moment. But as we see the revelation of the new covenant progresses, when Jesus came and said to his disciples, we only teach to Jewish people. And then after the resurrection, he sends them out to the Gentiles. And so they had a vision for evangelism and mission, but they still did not have a vision for an international church, a body of people. But as Paul went on in his life, he saw a couple of things happening. He saw that the number of people among the Gentiles that were becoming believers was growing enormously, exponentially more than they ever expected. It totally began to change his viewpoint that this was not just people being added on to the Messianic community in Israel, like a few guests, like you all are here today. But you're talking about an enormous international body that by pure numbers was going to outweigh in percentage what had been going on in Israel. The next thing he saw as he went on to his life, that he began to see that Yeshua prophesied that Jerusalem was about to be destroyed. I believe that Peter and the original 12 did not understand it very well. But as Paul goes on in his life, and it seems like he died in the late 60s, that Jerusalem, 060s, not 1960s. <laughs> but he, but, and you remember that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So as he began to get more mature in his ministry, not only did he see the enormity of the increase of the international body, but... He also saw that the prophecy of Jerusalem being destroyed and an extended exile was coming closer. So he sort of put <laughs> two and two together and, and realize, began to realize that God had a whole other plan that really had never been uh, uh, known to people up until this time, really until the mid-60s of the first century. Even to Peter, they didn't understand that. In fact, Peter said, I... I don't really understand all the things that Paul is saying. But Paul began to see this, this move, this transition away from Israel toward the international body. And in this letter, he describes the height. It's a kind of a, a master plan for this international group of people. Now, what I would like to call this group of people is not the church, but the word as it is in the original, in the, in the Greek is ekklesia. Now, one of the reasons we want to do that is because there's so many different associations with the word church that I don't know what you're even thinking of when I say that word. 
So let's go back and use the original word in a, in a, a purpose to try to understand what was the original meaning of that word when they said that. Okay, so Paul is talking about a group of people which he calls, of course Yeshua called it first, the ecclesia. And what is going to happen with this group of people? Now here I'm not so much talking about an individual congregation in different places, but all of the congregations together all around the world, this international body, the ecclesia. And that is the primary theme of the whole book of Ephesians. Now, let's just, uh, in kind of an absurd way, let's just do a little survey of the book of Ephesians here. You can kind of divide it into different parts as he goes through. The first part, which you'll see from chapter 1, uh, verse 1, up through about 14, he goes again and he says that God has a plan that he designed before the beginning of creation. That's his thesis in the beginning of, 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 of Ephesians. That's an amazing thing to say. It's not really, it's not written so clearly in anywhere else in the Bible. God has a plan. What he wanted to do, and he set this plan before he created the earth. And this plan is coming forth. That's the first section. It should be an encouraging. In other words, things aren't just happening. All this is happening according to God's plan. The next section, the second half of chapter 1, he begins to describe that if you will pray, God will give you a revelation about that plan. In other words, not only was there a plan, but the plan has been secret. People have not known it. And now if we will pray, God will give us a spirit of revelation to understand what that plan is. You got that? So first he says there is a plan from before creation. Now we can pray to get a spirit of revelation to understand what that plan is. Isn't that exciting? Well, that was chapter 1 on a nutshell. And then he goes in and then he begins to say, as he begins to start chapter 2, that the center of God's plan is a group of people. That he wants to particularly bless this group of people. It's a minority out of the total human race. It's a privileged group of people. A group of people that are privileged by grace. That are going to receive his love and receive his blessing. And the plan of God is centered on that group of people. A people that have been chosen by grace to receive the love of God. And they are saved and then called out of their people groups into this body called the Ecclesia that will be blessed by God. And that group of people will then reflect how loving and wonderful and gracious God is. So you go from the plan of God to prayer about the plan to seeing that the plan is focused on a privileged group of people. Plan, prayer, prayer privilege that's about the first two and a half chapters there and it reveals this and he says these people will be saved out of the human race by grace through the blood of Yeshua and they will uh, they will become the reflection of God's grace and his wisdom then amazingly enough the next section actually the largest section of the whole book is when you go from chapter 2, verse 11, all the way through chapter 3, verse 13, which talks about the relationship between Jew and Gentile. You know, no matter how much universal and international you want to make the gospel, you always come back to this difficult problem of relationship between Jews and Gentiles. You just can't get away from it. I mean, to tell you the truth, as I as a Jew, I'd, like to, I'd rather get away from it. Who wants to hear about this all the time? I mean, talk to me about love. Talk to me about faith. Talk to me about... And it always brings us back to this issue. Now, it's interesting here, and we'll come back to this later, but if you look at the word ecclesia, it means that people are called out. The word e is like, is ek is like exit. You're called out of the people group that you're in, in and into this body. But... That can give you a misconception because you're not just called out. Here he says that this group of people immediately become fellow citizens with Israel. You're called out, but you're called into. 
You're called out of nations and into being fellow heirs and fellow citizens with the prophets of, of ancient Israel and the community of faith within Israel. So you're not just a, a floating international ecclesia, but you are called out and then immediately become fellow members with the people who were in faith before we came to the time of the cross. And it is through the cross and by grace that we can be grafted in together. Because if it's not for the cross, if it was the way Judaism is, then everyone would have to convert to become an Orthodox Jew. And that's not God's plan. God's plan is that we would all receive grace through the cross, through the blood of the Messiah, Yeshua. And that brings us into a place where we can become one together. So the church is grafted, is called out and then grafted in. Well, that brings us all the way up toward the end of uh, chapter 3. In, uh, in chapter 4, he begins to describe this, this, what we call apostolic team ministry. He begins to describe how there are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers who will uh, move this group of people internationally to come to fulfill the plan of God. And he was saying, you can't just fulfill the plan of God by personal faith in Yeshua. This group of people has to come together, and they're led by these teams of different types of leaders, apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, which will move this international ecclesia into its destiny. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to say, in chapter 4, he begins to give some principles of integrity. Because if you're going to walk with the Lord, it's not just philosophical faith. You have principles of life and faithfulness and integrity. He begins to describe those in, in chapter 4. And then he goes on, particularly in chapter 5, on how to relate to authority. Of all the issues of faith, relating to authorities, always the most difficult one. And he goes into that specifically. And as he comes out in chapter 5 of talking about authority, in the family, in the business, in the, in, the, in the congregation. He particularly begins to talk about the relationship to husband and wife. And then he begins to describe this body of people as a bride. As the, the, the bride of Jesus, the bride of Christ. And then she, that she re receives all of her glory. And then the last part he goes on to talk about spiritual warfare. She's not only a beautiful bride, she's a fighter. Hallelujah. And gets dressed up in uh, warfare. Now, uh, that was kind of a brief survey. Of all that, what I want to give you to try to summarize this now and focus this in, I would like to give you the main theme, and then what are the three parts of it, and then how we get there. See if we can do that in six or seven minutes. The main theme of the book of Ephesians is God's master plan for the ecclesia. What is God's plan for this group of people who are believers in Yeshua? Now, he describes this in many ways throughout the book. But I see in it three particular parables that I want to point out to you in this book very quickly. Just briefly touch upon them. We're just trying to do an overview today. And so how he describes this group of people in three different ways. And I'll tell you what they are right away, and we'll come back and do it. The three ways are a glorified bride, number two, an extended family, and number three, a spiritual government. I'll say that again. A glorified bride, an extended family, and a spiritual government. Was that easy? Did you get that? Well, that only took me about a thousand hours of meditation to get to that. So if you got that, you can tell me thank you after the lesson. Okay, now let's go through those three parables. We'll just give about two minutes to each one because I want you to see the overview. The parable about the glorified bride, of course, is in Ephesians 5. Let's look at that. Um, verse 25. Anashim, and says, and men, love your wives just as the Messiah Christ loved the church, loved the ecclesia, and gave himself up on her behalf. Yeah, verse 27, and says, 
Makavod. Hallelujah. And he says that he might present her to himself. It glorified in honor. So what we see here is the picture of a husband serving his wife to bring her into a place of being beautiful, glorified, the princess, the, the queen. And, and he's doing that, and he's describing that, that this group of people is to be that. It, how come all the women are winking and smiling and looking at each other? Hey, man, like you didn't, how come my husband didn't get that? Guys, if you didn't get that, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Our number one job in life is to make your wife glorious. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Um, thank you, ladies. Okay. But so he is bringing this, and he's talking about a group of people that are beautiful, desirous in his eyes, and share intimacy with him as on the model of a husband and a wife. Now, what do you need to do that? The, that primarily takes place in praise and worship. And that's why we get together every single day for two to three hours just with our whole team and with guests that come and just worshiping the Lord and praising him, coming into a place of intimacy. And that's why you have prayer houses and worship and praise going up around the whole world today. We love people that are doing that everywhere in the world. We particularly thank our friends from Kansas City who helped to move that on. But wherever people, one of the central things of any community of faith is you spend time in intimacy, praise and worship the Lord. You experience beauty and closeness. And we, we all, us men too, we're part of the bride here. We come to experience intimacy with Yeshua. And he, to his eyes, that is beautiful. I don't know what you think is beautiful. But what he thinks is beautiful is seeing people all around the world of different colors, different ethnic backgrounds, different languages, all worshiping him passionately like a husband wants to see his wife react to him. So women, that was your side of it. Now, um, but that's beautiful to him. So who are we as a group of people? We are, first of all, a bride that loves and worships Yeshua in intimacy. Amen? Amen. Now, to do that, you don't need Jewish people. You don't need covenant. You don't need the covenants of the past. You don't need kingdom. You don't need authority. You don't really need apostles. You probably need prophets. But you have, that's an international spiritual body. You with me? Let's look at the... Um, second parable which is an extended family let's look in chapter 3 verse 14 14 and 15 mishum kach korea ani al birkai lifne ha'av asher kara shem lechol mishpacha b'shamayim uva'aretz and it says for this reason I bend my knees before the father to whom is called all of the family in heaven and earth I want you to notice this word, family. I was thinking about the whole chapter and a half that leads up to that. From chapter 2, verse 11, all the way up into this verse. And there it's talking about Jew and Gentile relating. I was thinking, well, why is that? And we talk about our covenant together. We talk about one new man. What's the point? I think this, as I've thought about it, this is the this verse sums up everything that went before that. What's the idea of Jew and Gentile coming together? It's that we are to become an extended family together. That God is looking, he's not just a husband looking for a bride, he's a daddy looking for a family. And in this family, it's an extended family. Where are you going to start it with? Where do you start the family of God? You start it with Abraham. And so th that's why he's saying that there already was an initial family core from Abraham to Yeshua and the initial disciples and apostles. And he said, now when people around the world come, he says, you don't just come to faith vertically. You also become part of our extended family together. So he said, you used to be without Messiah and God in the world, but you were also strangers to this family. So now come in and become part of the family. Now, it's not, first of all, Jew and Gentile issue. The issue is that God is looking to build an international family. It had to start somewhere. 
Of course, it started in Israel. It started with the children of Abraham. It started with Jesus and his disciples who were all Jewish and Israelis. But he's saying when you come to faith, you don't just get saved. Because the ultimate purpose of God is not to just to give you fire insurance and a helicopter ticket. It's to give you to be, you got that fire insurance, not go to hell, helicopter ticket, go to heaven. But it means that you become joined into a family. Now that makes you feel a lot better. See, you're coming in to be part of a family. And since that family just happened to have started with a group of Jewish people, for you to become part of that family, you've got to be connected to that group of people. Does that make sense? Ah, oh, but there's a problem. That may have seemed okay in the first century. I mean, you still have Peter and Paul and James and John walking around. Now, for the past 2,000 years, our people have been in exile. Jerusalem's been destroyed. Jewish people haven't been walking with the Lord. Where do you, where do you connect into? There wasn't any Israel to connect into. I mean, I know we get all upset about replacement theology, but when you think about it, I mean, it seems sort of obvious. I mean, there wasn't any Israel to get plugged into. You had to have faith to believe in the prophecies. Okay, well, you should have, but I can understand why it was a problem. But now that Israel is a nation again, ah, there's an opportunity. Oh, wait a minute. How do I get plugged in? The Israel is a nation still not believers. Ah, to rabbis. Wait a minute but they don't like Jesus. What, to the president, to prime minister, Netanyahu. Yeah, but he's not a believer. Oh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the gay community in Tel Aviv. No, that doesn't work. Where do you get plugged into? There has to be some kind of messianic community within Israel for you to get plugged into. And finally, I mean, this has only happened in our generation. This, all this, revel I don't know what people read in the book of Ephesians. What did they read all these 2,000 years? They were this Jew, Gentile, one new man grafted in. What is, what is this talking? You know what? Forget it. Paul didn't understand. That must be in something new. But now that Israel is a nation, there's a believing community in here that is reaching out. We can make friendship. Now this is being revealed to us in a way that I dare to say that I don't even think Paul could have understood what, was, what we're seeing right now. This is the, we're continuing in what he revealed to us. So, first of all, we are a bride to worship the Lord. Secondly, we are an, a glorified bride. Secondly, we are an extended family. And here's the last part. The last part, we are a spiritual government. Let's look in, in Ephesians uh, 1, 21, and we'll end here. Me'al l'chol memshala v'shilton g'vura u'misra and it says this, that um, he set Yeshua above all government and authority and power and principality and every name that is called, not in this world alone, but also in the world to come. And he put everything under his feet and gave him to the ecclesia as head over all. This is an amazing thing. Because the word ecclesia, and I learned this from uh, Cody that taught this just recently, uh, that the word ecclesia in ancient Greek was not just people that were being called out. They were the government leaders. They were the coalition. They were the, you want to say something? They were the elected cabinet members. They were the parliament of the ancient world. So when you say ecclesia, we're giving it to you. are called out to worship the Lord as a bride. You're called out and then to be joined together with the family of Abraham. But then you're also called out to become part of the spiritual parliament of Jesus. He is the king, but he's not going to rule the world alone. Just as when, when you have the prime minister of, of, of Israel, he has his cabinet and the cabinet forms a coalition and the coalition works through the Knesset and the Knesset rules the country. You can Nobody rules alone and you don't just rule through the whole Knesset. You have a, a group of people in, in uh, levels that form the coalition of the government. And that's what this group of people, that's what God's calling you to. He's calling you, first of all, to be a glorified bride, to worship him. Secondly, to be part of an extended family, which is why we have to be together. And thirdly, 
to rise up and understand authority and to become part of the governing coalition, the governing parliament of Yeshua that will rule over the whole world from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the world. In other words, spiritual authority is part of the definition of who the ecclesia is. Now let's summarize this. Let's try to get a summary statement. When you become a believer, you become part of the ecclesia. And this ecclesia, by this, and I said there's many more parables in there. It were a body, we're a tabernacle, we're a warriors, there's a lot, but those three stand out in my mind. I'm trying to make it simple. We are called out of the nations to worship him as a bride, a glorified bride. Number two, we are called out of the nations to be joined into the extended family of God which necessarily means relationship with Jewish people. And thirdly, we are called out and up to become a spiritual government to rule and reign with him. Which means if we are to fulfill this purpose, this amazing purpose of the Ecclesia, we have to know how to worship him in intimacy. We have to know how to be joined together in reconciliation. And we have to know how to receive spiritual authority to govern over the world to come. Isn't that exciting? So let's open our hearts to this purpose of God, to know how to worship him as a glorified bride, to be joined together in relationships as an extended family, and then how to receive authority from him to be his governing body, both in this world and in the world to come. That's how I understand the book of Ephesians. Father, we thank you in the name of Yeshua that what Paul wrote there, he was seeing it perfectly, but also seeing it from afar. And we're seeing the exact same thing, but chronologically, historically, we're a lot closer to what he saw. And we thank you, Father, for opening up the meaning of the book of Ephesians, setting it in its place as such an important piece of scripture. Lord, that we could read it, understand it, get a revelation about it, and then actively be part of its fulfillment both in this age in the age to come, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you. Amen.